Good morning, everyone. Welcome here. We welcome you to stand, or we invite you to stand and sing some praise this morning. Here we go. It was not for nothing that you shared your blood. So I'm going to live like my shame is gone. Won't be shocked. The way I was I'm gonna live like my chains are gone Just a moment and greet the people around you. Welcome here this morning. Go ahead and 
have a seat where you are. If you are visiting with us this morning, it is great to have you here. My name is Chris and I serve on the team here as pastor of Worship Arts Ministries. And we are excited. We have just recently moved to this uh, two service structure. So we're glad to have you here at our 915 service. If you are just kind of getting to know how things are working around Kekona and you have just started joining us, there's a few ways that you can keep up to date. Number one, and the, the probably the best way is to get our weekly news flash. You can email info at kilcona.org and get connected with that. And then every week you get, it's like the highlights reel of what's happening around here. We also have an Instagram and a Facebook account that you can follow. So go ahead and log into those things and check out and keep up to date about what's going on here. If you have small children here this morning, um, the nursery for up to two-year-olds is open for parents to be with their kids, but it is staffed in the second service. And of course, we have our children's ministry happening in the second service at 11 o'clock. So we do invite you to take advantage of those things. Today, after service, if you have recently started coming and joining our community, we are going to be having a welcome lunch just to get to know you and let you get to know us a little bit, give you a little bit of backstory on how Kona came to be and what we're about today. And so if you've never been to a welcome lunch, even if you've been coming for a year, um, you're welcome to join us today. Lenore always makes a little bit extra and my husband really doesn't need two helpings. So you can have his. So come for lunch. Oh, he made it to the first service. Sorry, honey. <laughs> Um, so anyways, um, it's after the second service today. So we invite you to join us. It'll be about 12.30 and uh, that'll be great. We would love to get to know you a little bit later. Um, we have uh, Eric Weens who's been giving the message last week and this week and he's just talking to us about how to share our story and how to be in relationship and really shine the light of Jesus in the world around us. And so to follow up, he's going to be leading us through four Teaching Tuesday classes. So we really invite you to come out and dig a little bit deeper into what he's been sharing. If you missed last week's message, then go and catch it on YouTube. Um, it's available on our YouTube channel and the play in the live streams and in the fall sermon series. And so go ahead and, and get caught up on last week because he, it was kind of the, the lead up to this week. But the follow-up sessions are gonna be really great. So we really invite life groups to do this together. If you're not in a life group, then come on out Tuesday night. There is supper. Lenore is cooking and her team. So like, come on out. Supper is at 6.30. If you can't get here for 6.30, the session starts at seven. Kendra usually comes out about 6.50, just as she flies in the door, eats supper, and then starts the session. So come on and join in with the community on Tuesday evening as we kick that off. Um, we have been, the last couple of years, we've been doing runs of Kilcona gear. I love seeing it. I love walking in and seeing people at the coffee counter or at the welcome counter wearing their Kilcona gear. And uh, we've had a few requests from people who missed it the last time and really would like to get it. Or they're like, I got this, but I'd really like to get that. So we're going to do one really short run just for, it's a pickup and if you want to get something for Christmas or whatever. Um, new, and, new this time around is we have toques, and they're super cute. So um, if you are interested in that, you can check it out at the table out there. Sophia's going to be there um, between services to just help you with that and get you an order form. It's a very short run, so if you're interested in shirts, we've got new colors and the sweaters and stuff like that, so you can go check that out. I'm going to get a zip up, because I find I've been wanting one lately to put over a t-shirt in this fall season. So that's kind of going to be my new thing. Um, we also have in the foyer, there's a lot going on. Um, we have the Operation Christmas Child Boxes. And lots of you are familiar with this ministry. They fill these boxes with some hygiene products and with some, um, some fun things. You don't want to just give a toothbrush and a pair of underwear. That's kind of boring for a kid. So mix it up. Um, there's, there is information on the website and on the little pamphlets about what not to put in. You don't want to put anything that is anything to do with, um, with war or anything that is violent toys or anything like that. You cannot put anything liquid. So toothpaste is a no-no. And uh, so we do invite you, though, if you haven't got a box, to go ahead and uh, pick one up today. And those can start coming in because the last day to bring them back is the 17th. So if you have yours all packed up at home already, then uh, bring those back in so that we can start collecting them and build a really nice display of those boxes. They are going to a colder country. 
And so we have a lady in the community who has knit. She just loves to knit. She's in her 90s, and she knits toques and, and things like that. So she has those out there, and those are $5 for one or 10 bucks for three. You can put them in your box. You can give them to kids that you know. You can wear it yourself if you like. And all of the proceeds from that are going to go directly to Operation Christmas Child to help with the box project. So those are available out there. Um, the boxes this year are going to Ukraine, uh, Ukraine and Moldova, Bulgaria and Romania. So these are countries who do experience colder temperatures, so mittens are okay, toques are okay as well. Coming up at the end, at the very beginning of the next month, our Classic Joy is hosting a Christmas dinner, and this is something you want to get tickets for. Don't wait till the end of November so that they can plan accordingly. It's going to be beautiful in here. They're going to have a lot of fun. So if you are in that 55 plus, Joy just stands for Just Older Youth. And so um, go ahead and get your tickets. That's available at the welcome counter today. We also have something else coming up in our Christmas season, which I'm very excited to tell you about. And this is our Worship Arts Christmas Cafe. If you've been around Kilcona for a while, you'll know that we have a very vibrant um, uh, worship arts team with a tremendous amount of giftedness. God has really blessed us in this area. And so we like to take every couple of years an opportunity to celebrate Christmas and to invite our family and our friends to come out. We set the whole place up with round tables, bring in desserts, and our artists share uh, whatever they have that, uh, that just to help people prepare for the Christmas season. Eric is talking about sharing our story and looking for opportunities to build bridges and share the light of Jesus. This is one of those opportunities. And so um, we love you but we're not doing it for you. We're doing it for our community. So there are only 168 tickets for each night. So tickets go on sale for that next week. So um, kind of be thinking about that. Um, it's going to be a great evening. And of course, we'll be needing some help to make it happen. So maybe you can help one night and attend another night. Put it in your calendar. Save that date. It's coming up really soon. We're going to continue on in ministry or in worship. And when we gather together here, we're coming from all walks of life. Some of us are walking through really wonderful seasons and others are walking through periods of grief. So wherever we are at, what unites our hearts is that we believe in Jesus. He is our foundation. He is our sure our sure foundation that never changes. So we want to declare that today, and uh, Dan and the band are going to lead us in a declaration of faith in the song, I Believe. So let's stand together as they do that. I believe there is one salvation, one doorway that leads to life, one redemption, one confession. I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe in the crucifixion, by His blood I have been set free. I believe in the resurrection, hallelujah, his life is dead as a feet. Oh, praise to God the Father, oh, praise to Christ the Son, oh, praise to the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome. Jesus, my 
Oh no, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? Oh no, I'll never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How could I ever walk away from the one who saved my life? All praise to Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit, our God has overcome the King.
Father, we come um, into worship here from different places. Some of us are riding on a mountaintop and some of us are in a deep valley. I pray this morning that as we bring this offering to you, that you would meet us, that we would see you, that we'd be rejuvenated, reinvigorated. I pray this in Jesus' name. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling oh come to Altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness. Precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior! Isn't He one? Sing 
bear your cross as you wait for the crown tell the world of the treasure you found lord jesus we come before you today knowing that we are insufficient to stand before our holy almighty god Yet you see each one of us. You see us when our hearts are exploding with joy. And you see us when our hearts are crippled with grief or anxiety or worry. So we come to your altar as we are, knowing that we can never be enough when we stand before you. And we are so thankful this morning that the blood of Jesus allows us to stand before you, knowing that you make up every insufficiency. You bring your peace, your comfort, your hope, joy that goes beyond our circumstances. So Lord, wherever we are at today, we come to you as we are, not pretending to be something that we're not, we come as we are. Lord, I pray for those among us today who are walking through deep waters with their health, with finances, relationships, struggles at work, worry and stress. And Lord, we just wanna hold those things out to you. Say, Lord, it's too much for us. And we give it to you, because we know you are almighty God and you cover it all and you see it all. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your grace. We stand under that this morning. Father God, just as we come to worship you with our song and, and to hear from you and, and to be challenged, Lord, as Eric speaks today, we also come and we bring an offering of our finances to you. And so, Lord, as we offer that this morning, I pray, Lord, it wouldn't just be checking a box, but that, Lord, this would go forth with a prayer to further your kingdom, to make an impact, to do things within these walls and without. So, Lord, we just bring our tithes and our offerings before you, and we give them to you without strings, that you would you would do with it as you see fit lord we thank you for the leadership of this church who are leading in this time and we just pray that you would continue to give them wisdom that you would continue to give them grace and that you would continue to bring focus and we thank you that you have a plan for this church in this corner of winnipeg amen as our offer ushers take the offering um we are going to be hearing again from Eric, as I mentioned. So uh, Eric, would you come and bring what God has laid on your heart? We look forward to hearing from you today. Good morning. Good morning. If Jesus came with you today to and, and met some of your friends and co-workers, would he be moved with compassion? Would he see people who face a Christless eternity without Jesus Christ? Do you? Our daily lives can become so repetitious that we miss the fact that we're surrounded by people who are facing real issues. Coworkers, friends, neighbors, family, who are, who are uh, at risk of losing a job, who may be struggling with self-worth, who could be not sure how they're gonna make ends meet by the end of the month. These are people that need our, need our friendship, they need our support, and they need to know Jesus Christ. 
They're lost without a shepherd. Imagine the difference in these people's lives if you befriended them and spent time to encourage and challenge them and show them that a relationship with Jesus can make a difference in their lives. God has placed you there for those people. Evangelism is simply joining a conversation that the Holy Spirit is already having with another person. I would say that again because we often think that, you know, we're plowing into something, but evangelism is joining a conversation that the Holy Spirit is already having with another person. Last week I talked about our purpose, to know God and love him with everything we have and to make him known to others. And that the power for that purpose comes through the Holy Spirit that produces fruit in our lives, that makes our lives stand out and gives us the courage to share our faith stories with people. Knowing the Holy Spirit is with us makes it easier to talk about Jesus. Jesus import, entrusted us with an important role. In Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, he says, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. This is no easy task. But the good news is, is that the verse didn't end there. There's another line. And he says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. He is by our side. That's the only way we can accomplish this, not in our strength, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that he's by our side. I'm a slow learner and God really had to <coughs> reinforce this in my life. A few years ago, Lucille and I felt, being, uh, felt that we were called to go to Columbia with Leader Impact. And I had been asked to come prepared to share a, a business talk along with my faith story. The first place that we went to uh, was, was in, the law, in the home of a, a construction lawyer, and her husband was a contractor. And they had invited some friends over and asked that I would share my talk and, and my faith story. They had asked for a shorter talk and longer faith story. And, uh, and, and so we, are, we arrived with our young interpreter, the, the young lady in the blue dress at the end. And uh, it was a very nice home and the couple had invited uh, the biggest contractor in the city as well as the mayor of the, of the adjacent city. The mayor was a very large man, the guy in the white shirt on the slide. He was easily six foot eight, well over 300 pounds. And uh, as a mayor, he was loud and very outspoken. And uh, so, and then just before we started dinner, the, the mayor and the host got into a very heated argument about the relevance of faith. In, and uh, the mayor's argument was that because churches couldn't get along and they had splits and stuff all the time, their message was irrelevant. And they were getting pretty worked up. Like, they, they were very passionate on both sides. And our young interpreter was doing a great job trying to keep us informed of this. And, uh, you know, my stress levels were, were rocketing up here in that, uh, you know, this was my first event the first time with, a, with an interpreter. Um, it was already an intimidating audience, and, and now they were hostile. And uh, fortunately, supper arrived, and, and uh, the hostess put on a great meal. Everybody else enjoyed it. And uh, I, I was really wondering, like, what does God want me to say here? And how is this going to play out? Like, I, I just couldn't see it. And so as we got up uh, after dinner, and uh, the host says, so you're going to answer all his questions, right? And I said, well, no. I said, I'm going to share what God's put on my heart. And if at the end he still wants to talk about conflict within the church, we'll go there at that time. And, uh, and so 
I said one more quick prayer in my, in my head and uh, began to share my, my story. And when I started, he was, the mayor was very, I'm not hearing, I'm not listening, you're wasting your breath, you know. Um, the, the body language was really clear. And I knew that the team at the hotel was praying for us. And, and uh, about five minutes in, he was starting to listen. His arms were down by his side. He wasn't crossed anymore. He was engaging. Ten minutes later, he was leaning into the discussion. At the end, 15 minutes later, he started to ask some really important questions. And half an hour later, everybody that had been invited to the meeting accepted Jesus Christ. Amen. And the big contractor says, you need to come to my office tomorrow. My staff need to hear about Jesus. And the, the process continued. Nothing that happened in that room had anything to do with me. That was the Holy Spirit from beginning to end. He had promised that he would go with us and give us the power to do what's necessary in that situation. All I did was be obedient and, and follow what he was asking me to do. He did everything else. You'll hear part of that story that I shared that night a little later this morning. It wasn't my eloquent talk that changed those people's heart. It was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is already engaged with people and is hoping that you will engage and join the conversation that he's already having. Are you willing to let him? Do you trust him enough to step into real relationships with people that he brings into your life? Influence begins with relationships, and relationships start with communication, conversations. Remember our homework last week? I asked that you would pray that God would put five to seven people on your heart that you could begin praying for them, that you could then begin building uh, relationships with these people. Now, going forward, you need to create opportunities to spend time with them. Take them for lunch, have coffee, go for a walk, you're not meeting to share the gospel yet, nor are you building fake relationships to pitch your faith. You're representing Christ. Christ spent time with people. He met their needs, and then he offered salvation. Get to know these people. Be there for them, and show genuine glimpses of Christ through your actions. I'm going to, uh, to share Four tips to help you have meaningful conversations. So first of all, conversations need to be done with gentleness and respect. Everyone's on a unique spiritual journey and may not be ready to hear about Jesus Christ the first time you meet with them or get together. Respect their journey. Do some probing to figure out where they're at. 1 Peter 3.15 says, Always be prepared to give an answer for the hope you have, but do it with gentleness and respect. The second point that I want to raise, tip, is that you need to own the burden of conversation. Be present and focused on the conversation, but when I say burden of conversation, when it, draws, when it goes quiet, somebody needs to initiate activity. And for some of us, I don't mind some silence. For some of us, for people like me, that can be hard work. Um, that's why it's called the burden of the conversation. Come prepared. Think about some questions that you might be wanting to ask. Simple things. Can you tell me about your family? What do you enjoy doing in your spare time? What do you enjoy about your job? Or the subsequent one, what drains you at your job? One of my favorite questions is, what's a fond memory from your childhood? And the follow-up question, what's a difficult memory from your childhood? Because that often leads to some very interesting discussions. Ask open-ended questions. 
You get to know people when they need to think through an answer and, and can't just say yes or no. Questions like, what inspires you? How did you get to where you are today? What does your journey look like? Where do you see yourself in five years? You're simply getting to know. And be prepared to share your answer, because they will likely parrot it back. And if they seem a little cautious in terms of just stepping out and answering, say, why don't I share first? I, I raise the question. And, and tell them your story and make sure you go to the level of vulnerability that you'd like them to have. Model what you're hoping to see in the relationship. And uh, take them on the journey. Make it easy for them. Listen to their responses. Relate to them. Share your experiences. And introduce vulnerability. And then, listen well and empathize. Be available to hear them vent or, in, or encourage them. I was out doing some work at my tree stand the other day, well, about two weeks ago, I guess, and my phone rings and I answered it. It's one of my fishing buddies, and he had had a really terrible day at work. And we spent 45 minutes talking about what was going on, and, and uh, I was able to coach him a little bit because he was in the moment going to do some things that probably long-term were not going to be that great. And I was able to encourage him to just slow down and, and breathe a little bit and, and talk, but I was there for him. And he knew I would be over our past experiences. And then you can offer to pray. As regional leader for Stantec, um, people needed to come into my office to, to uh, tell me if they were going on long-term disability and why. And, uh, and usually when it's long-term disability, it had to do either with medical problems or significant family issues. And uh, they would usually be fairly emotional about the process. And so as I would ask what was going on, they would share. And, and then I would ask to pray for them. And when they said yes, they always said yes. I was their boss. <laughs> but actually, they, they said yes because at that stage in life, when you're going through that, people are looking for help. They're looking for someone to care, and they're hoping that there's a God out there somewhere that cares. And so I would ask them, what would a miracle in your situation be? And they would share, and we would pray together. And I would continue to pray, and it's amazing how many of those miracles God answered. They'd come back in my office to say that they're back at work, and I would always ask, what happened with the miracle we prayed for? And yeah, there was always the risk, because some of them, the miracle wasn't answered, and we had to talk through that. But in the ones that miracle was answered, it gave me an opportunity to introduce them into how they could have a relationship with Jesus, that Jesus had showed his love to them. And that, and that uh, if they weren't ready then, I would introduce them to a, to a church near their home. And often that included me going with them to that church because it was close to them. I would check with, my, with the pastor at the time, whichever one it was, and, and, uh, and we would find a good church in that neighborhood and I would promote that one. And then I would go with them to introduce them to people. Otherwise, for a person going the first time, it's a really scary proposition to go to a church, or even if they haven't been for a long time. Plus, are they going to actually take the effort to connect with somebody? And so I would go along and try and connect them with people that lived in their neighborhood that followed Jesus. Building trust with people can take months, even years, to, and you may never see them go across the finish line. The key is to walk with people at their pace, knowing that the Holy Spirit is working and is with you and is leading that and that you need to trust the Holy Spirit. We sometimes want to push things and, and the Holy Spirit knows the journey this person's on. Often, you'll only get to share a small piece of your Christian journey, but be faithful in sharing that small piece and be adaptable and trust the Holy Spirit. 
We want to have impact in our community. But do you have any non-Christian friends? Good non-Christian friends. By good, I mean close. Um, you know, about 15 years ago, God really challenged me on this. I had lots of non-Christian acquaintances, but I wouldn't say I had really close non-Christian friends. And, and I enjoy going fishing, and when you go fishing, you get to spend a lot of time together. You're driving there, you're in the boat all day, you're driving home, and, uh, and there's no getting out. <laughs> but, uh, but God challenged me that I needed to take a few less Christian friends and, and begin building deeper relationships with, my, with non-Christians in my life. And so I've done that, and, and you know, it, it's been really rewarding. Two weeks ago, I spent a couple days in Duck Mountains with Simone and Harmon and Nick, uh, and we were fishing for tiger trout. And over the last couple years, I've really learned to love these guys. Um, and before each trip, I pray that God would give me opportunities to, to bring my faith into the conversation. And, and I ask that I would do that with gentleness and respect, because I can sometimes want to push. I, I'm a type A personality, and I want to get somewhere. Today's the day, you know. Um, and I need to be very sensitive to the Holy Spirit saying, you know, where are you at? And again, I prepared some questions that I would ask. I didn't need to actually use them on this trip. You know, the first night we're there, we're sitting around um, playing some cards in the, in the, in the resort, and, and uh, a couple of the guys are going like, I-, I need to go to bed. I'm really hopeful that I can get a good night's sleep. I haven't slept well in, 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 in quite a while, and, and I'm hoping the weather will help me. And it, the simple, what's keeping you awake at night these days? And they shared, and I was able to talk a little bit about when I've gone through a challenge like that, and and the relationship that, or or the difference that my relationship with Jesus and turning things over to him has allowed me to sleep. It was simple. We ended at that, and like after we shared, and and we went to bed. You know, and I let the Holy Spirit continue working, and on the drive home with one of the guys, I wasn't driving, he was driving, and... uh, And I simply engaged in a dialogue around what does your spiritual journey look like? And I I offered to share first because um, he hadn't and I was posing the question. And so we talked for an hour and a half about each of us, 45 minutes on our, what our journey had looked like. It's taken us three or four years to get to the point where he's willing to openly talk about personal spiritual matters. I encourage, sorry, I got lost there. I encourage you to look at at your circle of influence intentionally. Engaging in meaningful conversations can be challenging and intimidating, but it can be very rewarding. I can guarantee you that you'll be surprised at how excited you get about the spiritual conversations you have and the joy that they bring in your life. And with the Spirit beside you, equipping you every step of the way, all that you need to do is be intentional. Build trust, own the burden of the conversation, ask open-ended questions, be present, listen well, and initiate conversations that matter. As we engage in meaningful relationships, over time, opportunities are gonna come to share about your faith. When that happens, use stories. Stories, everyone loves a good story, and stories connect us to people, and, uh, and they allow us to be relatable. Advertisers know that they can use stories to influence our buying, and, and they use them effectively in marketing. You know, that car takes you to adventure. That cream will t- keep you young or the one that I fall for all the time, this lure will catch you the biggest fish, (laughs) you know? Stories help us 
understand others and ourselves. And if friends ask you, how you stayed calm in a situation, how are you going to respond? Jesus often used parables to answer important questions. Parables are stories. And in Matthew 25, he tells the story of three servants. Jesus describes a wealthy master who entrusted large sums of money to three servants. The first one, he gave five bags of money, and that servant took it, invested the money well, and he doubled the the investment. The second servant did the same thing with the two bags of money that he'd been given. But the third servant was afraid of the master, and he buried the bag um, so, and uh, didn't do anything to cause it to be able to have grown. This is an important story for us even now because the treasure that God has entrusted to us includes the story that we're co-authoring with him. The true ultimate treasure is the gift of salvation, the eternal life that Christ offers. What we do with that treasure is important. And are you making investments with it or have you buried it to keep yourself safe? I'm gonna share a few tips that'll help you make good investments with your story. As you engage with people and exude the fruit of the Spirit, they're gonna see that there's a difference in your life, especially under stressful situations. Be prepared to share pieces of your story when that happens. It's important to remember that everyone is on a unique journey um, and at different levels of, of openness to the gospel. Tailor what you say to your audience. You need to know them through all the other questions you've been asking about them and see how God is working with them and connect your life to theirs at that point. Today we're gonna focus on discovering your spiritual journey. This will help you prepare which parts to share and when. And then over the next four teaching Tuesdays, four, next four Tuesday evenings, we're gonna help you finish one story, flesh it out, and, uh, and practice sharing it once in a small group. This sounds really scary, and it is for a few minutes, but the rewards are really important because it gives you confidence because you'll have heard from your, the people in your small group that your story impacted their life, that they've been moved by it. And you'll have the confidence to know that how to put it together. But the real big reward of this, these next Teaching Tuesdays is you're going to get to hear the stories of what God's been doing in all the people in your group's life. It's really encouraging time. Three minutes of scary for many hours of, of really uh, exciting and enjoyable times. Musicians know that you can't improvise without knowing your scales. And it's the same with your life. The Holy Spirit needs you to know your your spiritual journey to help you improvise which pieces to share when the moment comes up. And so, Being an effective conduit of the gospel is about journeying with people and treating them with respect and compassion. Honest conversations offer the best opportunities for faith-related topics to come up naturally. The objective is to bring each person simply one step closer to Christ. Understanding where they're at in their journey is important, and, and so that you can break that down in in your things. So now we're gonna look at how, what are some of the steps of of discovering your story? So first of all, you need to reflect on your journey to and with Christ. Just jot down in simple point form some things that will, will jar your memory about different times in your relationship with God. You may have been raised as a, in a Christian home and and knowing about him all your life? Or maybe it took hitting rock bottom before you were willing to look outside yourself. Think about the times that in your life when Christ became real 
or when your relationship with him grew. Many times our spiritual journey will we'll go through a growth period and then there'll be a plateau, maybe even a, a dip sometimes, and then we'll have another growth period. Those growth periods are your stories because that's where God is meeting you and you're growing in your understanding of him. And as you reflect on your story in each of those points, think about why your life is better because you have a relationship with Jesus. Second, pick a story in your journey, one of those places along the line where you've been growing, and, and pick one that's relevant to where your friends might be at today, your friends and coworkers. A, gr a great story has a dynamic character, a great ending, a twist and a turn in it, and proof of change. And your story should have all these elements. I can hear the objections. I'm not a dynamic character. My life is boring. Well, trust me, I I've seen literally hundreds of people go through this process, and everyone who gets honest about their life and steps out in faith has a story. And several of the most dynamic stories I've heard came from people who were adamant they didn't have one. The dynamic part of your story is you painting a transparent picture of what you were like before you met Christ or bef what you were going through before that journey of growth in, in, your, in your life. What did it really look like? Um, what, was your, what were your driving forces? The things that you were chasing after. Some of the common drivers you can see are listed on the slide are anger or resentment, fear, guilt, materialism, or pleasure, and a need for approval. Those are common ones. There's other ones, but those are often probably that, that people's stories fall into. In the story I shared last week, you heard about how the fact that I had a strong need for people's approval and that I was carrying a bag of guilt around. And uh, so don't be afraid to share about the trials that are in your life, that you've gone through. Let your guard down and take a risk for Jesus. When you're transparent, people will trust you and they'll relate to you. They're going through the same kind of things. Your story needs to be real. Then comes the turn. At some point in your journey, something changed. Jesus entered the picture, or you were seeing Jesus in a new way, and it made a difference in your life. The turning point is the heart of your story. This is the point when you came to realize that you could no longer go on living the way you were. This is the important, it's where you think about the value of life sorry, the value that a life with Christ offers. Be authentic, vulnerable, and they'll appreciate your honesty. Make your joy or your sadness, your fear or your courage real to them. How did this come to happen? What happened that made you realize that something needed to change? And then, what's the proof that a relationship with Jesus makes a, makes a difference? This is the exciting part of the story as you look back and can be very encouraging even in your own journey to go through and see these things. Um, it's almost like putting up little altars along the way uh, as you reflect on them. What, what difference did, it, did a relationship with Jesus make? What does your life look like today? How has your faith made an impact on you? Describe how, how faith has spoken into your uh, personal and professional life and, ha and how it influences your hope for the future. And then, you need to write out your story. And as you write, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal which things you should include and which things you should leave out and to give you the courage to be vulnerable and, uh, and transparent along the way. 
Write your story in a way that'll resonate with the people that you can envision sharing it with, the people on that list that God's put in your mind. The three components of your story need to be concise. Don't include any details that are irrelevant because they become distractions. They might be interesting, but if they're not relevant to the story, leave them out because they'll become the point and you don't want that to be the point. Anything you share, or sorry, anything else can become a distraction and don't simply say, I, I'm, I was scared. Share what you were scared about and what that fear was doing in your life. How, how was it playing out? And as you look at what your life is like now, make sure that the illustration you use points back to the original illustration that you shared at the beginning of the story. For example, if you used a point uh, on your original story before Christ um, that was dealing with fear, be prepared to share how the difference with Jesus has and how you deal with fear now um, so that there's a change. Your story matters and it needs to be shared. And as you work on your story, continue to pray for the five to seven people on your list and, and look for ways to spend time with them to begin building the relationship, strengthening your relationship, and show that you care what they're going through. Jesus has given you a portfolio of gifts and talents and experiences to use in his service. Your story is one of them. In closing, I'm going to share a, a bit of the messy part of my life that will explain how I found a deeper relationship with Jesus and how Jesus has met my spiritual needs and allowed me to flourish. As a young end office leader, I won a, a large land development project for a new client. And like most land development projects in our business, it was going to be done really fast because the market's always time to market. And so, we, uh, we did a background check on the developer to make sure he had the financial resources to, to deliver the project. And we put a detailed plan into place. And we delivered that uh, project as per plan. We delivered the design to the community-owned organization that was going to deliver it, or, or on whose land it was going to be built. Um, and as we submitted the drawings, there was a sudden and unexpected change in the community leadership, and, and the approval process stalled. And at the same time, the residential market crashed. And shortly thereafter, we discovered that the developer had leveraged those same funds that we were relying on to, uh, in two other cities. And because it was a widespread uh, market crash, he filed for bankruptcy. Um, because it had been a really fast-paced project, we were left with a huge receivable, which when he filed for bankruptcy meant that we were left with a huge financial loss. And as a young engineer, I knew that, you know, I blamed myself for not seeing this ahead of time, and I knew that the financial loss put my job in jeopardy. And as I lay, lay awake at night, I began to worry, and, uh, and I was losing a lot of sleep, leaving me exhausted. It really put into, I began to doubt my ability to lead, to, to lead the office and to, uh, to run, run the organization. And it really put into doubt the dreams that I'd been working for. I, I grew up going to church. And up until this point in, in my life, things had gone pretty smoothly. It had been easy for me to trust Jesus. But here I was, a, a young man. At, uh, I was married with two little kids, a mortgage, no money in the bank, and at risk of losing my job in an economy where there weren't going to be any other jobs. And as I sat up at night, I began to wonder, like, does, does God care about me, and 
And I really faced a, a dilemma of belief at that point. I, I either had to trust God and through this situation and, and, and see what has happened, or I might as well walk away from my faith because it was meaningless. And uh, I wanted God to love me, and I wanted a relationship with God, and so I chose to give everything to God and see what would happen through this situation. And uh, I discovered that God was right there waiting. I just hadn't really let him in. Yes, I had him in my life, but I hadn't given him my life. And, and as I talked to Jesus, and I told him about uh, what I was feeling, and asked for help, I was amazed at how my personal stress levels began to come down. And as I, as I spent time in God's presence, uh, telling him about my, my experiences, my, my fear of personal failure, my fear of not being able to provide for my family, and that my dreams seemed to be falling apart. It was amazing how God took the stress off my shoulders, and I was able to begin to sleep again. And, and as I began to be able to sleep more, uh, God was able to restore my energy level and the positive attitude, and I was able to encourage my team. You see, they were afraid too. They, they knew that the economy was really bad and we had lost a lot of money. Sure, they may not have made the decision to work for that developer, but that didn't necessarily help them out big time. Um, and so I was able to encourage them and, and, uh, and reinforce that we were going to work through this. And as I spent some time praying with God, God gave me some insight into a couple of projects I hadn't been aware of, and they were small, but we were able to keep my team engaged and employed. More importantly, my family and friends began to see changes in me, changes that they liked. You see, I had over the years allowed anger to build up in my life over wrongs that were taking place or that I felt had been done to me, and that anger would come boiling out in some rather unpleasant ways. And as I began to spend time with God praying and spending more time reading the Bible, God began to deal with that anger, teaching me how to forgive those people. And as I forgave them, I became a kinder, gentler, more patient man, a man that everybody found it a lot easier to like. When I gave my, decided to give everything to God, he didn't make all my problems go away. That land developer, he was still broke. And I still had to deal with a f huge financial loss with my company. But I discovered that God was there and that he wanted to walk through life with me. Just like the, the picture on the slide, as I look back, I can see how God has walked beside me over the last years through the good times and the hard times. And I've discovered that even in the hard times, that as I trust God and, and, really, and give him the situation, that I can, I, can, I can go through life without the worry, that I can trust him that at the end of it, regardless of what the outcome is, that I will be in his hands and we will be better off than when we started at that beginning of that event. So now, almost 30 years later, I'm still walking through life with Jesus, and I can't imagine how I would have lived without him. Giving my life to Jesus has allowed him to bring the balance that I needed to flourish. Maybe my, my personal stories made, the, made you question whether you're looking after the spiritual component of who you are and, and whether and what your life might look like if you had a deeper relationship with Jesus. If you're interested, I'd be glad to talk with you afterwards. At, I'll be at the front. You can come and see me. Gladly just talk about where, I, where what happened and wh what I learned and where you're at. 
Today, I've challenged you regarding what you're going to do with the story that God's co-authoring with your life, the treasure that God's placed in your responsibility. Are you investing that story for a return, or are you hiding it to keep yourself safe? As we prepare to celebrate communion today, this might be one of the things that you need to reflect on. Communion serves as a time of introspection and spiritual renewal. This time provides an opportunity for believers to reflect on their relationship with God, seek forgiveness, and recommit themselves to living a life aligned with Jesus. The act of partaking in communion invites you to examine your hearts, express gratitude for God's grace, and seek spiritual nourishment for the journey ahead. So if I could ask the servers to come forward. The act of taking communion is a sacred and, and, uh, and solemn practice that's really important to us here at Kilcona. And if you've committed your life to Jesus, uh, we'd enjoy that uh, you would partake with us this morning and join the celebration. If you haven't made a decision to follow Jesus, I would ask that you simply pass the plate by when it comes to you. There's no shame in passing the plate by. Each of us is on a spiritual journey, and we're glad that you're journeying with us today. I'm just going to read. While the and Jesus said, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks and offered it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine um, from now until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Um, as it's being passed out, uh, just hold it, and then uh, when everybody's got it, I'll pray and we can uh, partake of it together. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus, as we partake of the bread and the grape juice this morning, we're reminded of the sacrifice that you made to demonstrate your amazing love for us, to pay the price for our sin, and to restore the relationship with, G with 
our Heavenly Father. And as we look back on our journey, we look at your grace and we're thankful for your gentleness in our lives. We ask that you would forgive any sin and we're thankful that you have promised that you are faithful and will forgive that sin and cleanse us. And we pray that as we go into this week, we would give you back control of our lives, of our throne, and that, and that uh, through the power of your Holy Spirit, we would, we would uh, be bold witnesses in our community and uh, share the good news of Jesus Christ. We love you with everything we have, Jesus. Amen. So you could partake of the bread and, and then the juice. If anyone would like uh, a, a quiet time or to, be, to have someone pray with you, there would, there's a prayer room over on the, just to my right here, and there will be people there to, to meet with you if you want. I want to thank you for joining us this morning. And as you go out, I encourage you to let your light shine brightly in our community and that you would spend some time reflecting on your spiritual journey. And uh, I hope to see you on Tuesdays where we can work together to, to figure out and help you flesh out your stories and uh, get more confident in sharing with uh, our neighbors and friends. Have a great week.